journalist and educator Jeff Jarvis believes we have entered the post-print age of communication. Jeff joins the Plutopia podcast this time as we discuss his book, The Gutenberg Parenthesis. Is that I think society was fundamentally conversational before print. That's fairly obvious. That's what we had. But even in the early days of print, Luther and the Pope held a conversation through their books and burnings of them. Um, Erasmus and Thomas More wrote letters to each other for the purpose of including them in the books because that was part of the conversation. What ruined the conversation, I think, was the mechanization and industrialization and corporatization of print and its products, this idea that they were products for that matter. And people couldn't fit into a conversation at that scale. And now my hope is that, that we rediscover the conversation. We're, we're bad at it. Society's long out of practice with it. Uh, we're doing an awful job of it. I'll concede all of that. But I treasure all the voices that can now be heard that were always there that were not heard in mainstream mass media run by people who look like me, old white men. Welcome. This is the Plutopia News Network podcast. Uh, I am John Lebkowski, and my partner over there is Scoop Sweeney. And our contributing genius, who is with us from time to time, Wendy Grossman, is on board. And our guest today is Jeff Jarvis. Uh, Jeff created and edited Entertainment Weekly many years ago and wrote about media for TV Guide, People Magazine, The Guardian. And then he became a blogger and blogs at buzzmachine.com to this day. Uh, he also holds the Leonard Toe Chair in Journalism and uh, innovate in journalism innovation i'm sorry and directs the toe knight center for entrepreneurial Gen journalism and those are both at city university of new york in the craig newmark graduate school of journalism or the craigslist graduate school of journalism he co-hosts a podcast this week in google and he's written several books, including What Would Google Do? and his latest, which we'll be discussing today, which is called The Gutenberg Parenthesis. Jeff, this and is for you to hold it up. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, which I thought was, I mean, my head really changed from reading the book. But uh, I think the first logical question for you is what is the Gutenberg Parenthesis and why is it? ending why is the parent closing so first thank you so much for having me i'm, I'm delighted to be uh be with you today uh, the good word parenthesis is a um concept that was put forward by three academics at the university of southern denmark uh tom pettit brought it to the u.s at mit lars ole sauerberg and marianne borch so they came up with this idea in the 90s saying that the gutenberg years were an exception in history or will have proved to be one and that before print, before movable type, and let's be important to say that, that it started in Korea and, and uh, China before it did in Germany, but marking Gutenberg, um, society was conversational. Words were passed around, information was passed around mouth to mouth and changed along the way, and we had a social sense of authority. And the aim of the scribes was to preserve the knowledge of the ancients. And the business model was pretty simple. One scribe, uh, one patron, a lot of time and one book. And along comes Gutenberg and movable type. And Marshall McLuhan would say that our cognition of the world changed. Uh, the, the line, and this sentence is an example, became our organizing principle. Uh, the business model changed. Uh, copyright came along in 1710, and we changed from conversation to this idea of content and property. And to my mind, the commons were then fenced in around the covers of a book. Our knowledge became linear beginning to end. Um, we weren't so much preserving the knowledge of the ancients as we were uh, honoring the current expert, Frau, Dr. Professor, so-and-so, who's the author of a book. And now if we come to the end of the Gutenberg parenthesis, and Pettit would, would emphasize that that's not a sharp line, that's a line that could take decades, um, generations, even centuries, uh, as the, the, the transition into print did. Um, we once again return to a time when knowledge is passed around mouth to mouth and our sense of authority is has to become more social. Um, the business model has changed because why we're fighting around copyright. Uh, we don't so much honor ancients or God help us experts anymore, but we, uh, as my friend David Weinberger said, we honor the network. The smartest person in the room is the room itself. 
And so I thought um, that there'd be lessons to learn from our transition as a society into this time of print, this print culture, as we now leave it. This is not to say that books die. It's not to say that print dies, though in newspapers and magazines, it probably will. Um, my magazine, Entertainment Weekly, is now out of print. Um, but it is to say that we have lessons to learn about this transition, as I hope we have agency to decide what the internet is going to be next. So this was, uh, this Gutenberg print, this is the very start of it was kind of, would you say a sharp turn or was it more a gradual turn? John, that's one of the biggest lessons I got in, in researching and thinking about the book. I thought it was a sharp turn, um, but it took, there's a, there's a timeline that fascinates me. It took 50 years, which was called the incunabular or infant phase of print, uh, before it shifted from mimicking the scribes, including the fonts, uh, to the book taking on the shape that we now know with titles, title pages, page numbers, paragraph indents. These kinds of institutions came later. Around the turn of the century, around 1600, 1500 rather, um, the business was in shambles because too much capital had gone into it and the market was saturated and the sound familiar, uh, and it was all ready for a crash. Then along came Martin Luther and that invigorated uh, the business of print. Fast forward to the 1600s, we see the first real a rush of innovation with print. The technology has receded in the background and of the foreground come the creators. We have the creation of the modern novel with Cervantes, the creation of the essay with Montaigne, the creation of a market for printed plays with Shakespeare and the invention of the newspaper. Um, and I wonder whether online we have to wait a long time before the technologists recede and creators come to the forefront. Go another century to 1710, the Statute of Anne, we have the invention of copyright again another century to 1800 uh, before we see the first changes in the technology of print. Other than that, it stayed pretty much the same from 1450 to 1800. Then other technologies came along, steam and means of, of, of molding entire pages and eventually the typesetting machine, which is one of my favorite machines out there, the linotype. And that is what led us to the mass media and mass market and scale and this economy and culture of scale that I think haunts us to this day. Next, 1920s, we get the first competitor to print, which is radio, 1950s TV, and here we are today. About a quarter century, more than a quarter century, from the introduction of the commercial browser and internet to most people, which would say, I think we're at the year 1480. So no, it's not a sharp line, to finally answer your question. I think it's a very gradual line um, that, um, had, that may presage that we're at the very beginning of still fundamental change in society as we go on to what follows the age of print. One of the reasons I find this particularly interesting is that I have a background as a folk singer. And so, of course, the oral tradition is a very big part of folk music in general, particularly traditional folk music, which is the stuff that interests me the most. And uh, there's a wonderful line that I, I wasn't able to find it when I was looking for it. Um, one of the w people from whom Walter Scott collected folk songs is supposed to have said to him something like, uh, you, you've killed my songs by printing them. And I, so I find that kind of, you know, the, the idea that the book sort of traps things in a frozen state, I find really interesting. And at the same time, though, when I wrote my first book or you know, the, the thing that really struck me was how much writing a book was like using Usenet, because there is a conversation among book authors, just as there was a, when I was taught music theory, I was taught that there was a conversation among composers, that they quote each other in, in, in one of the things you learn when you study this stuff is that this, this composer quoted this other piece and he inverted the, he inverted the theme and he did this and other. And, and books are like that. Like you, your, your book is full of so many quotes from other people. And so how can you, how can you not see it as part of a conversation? Uh, amen, Wendy. To, to your first point about that freeze drying of creativity, which I think is, is so important. Um, in Shakespeare's time, playwrights, I learned Shakespeare, the playwrights did not really want their plays to be printed for fear that they'd be pirated on other stages. It was the companies that owned the plays. 
your point about conversation is the very essence of what I'm trying to get to in this book, is that I think society was fundamentally conversational before print, that's fairly obvious, that's what we had. But even in the early days of print, Luther and the Pope held a conversation through their books and burnings of them. Um, Erasmus and Thomas More wrote letters to each other for the purpose of including them in the books because that was part of the conversation. What ruined the conversation, I think, was the mechanization and industrialization and corporatization of print and its products, this idea of the, that they were products for that matter. And people couldn't fit into a conversation at that scale. And now my hope is that, that we rediscover the conversation. We're, we're bad at it. Society's long out of practice with it. Uh, we're doing an awful job of it. I'll concede all of that. But I treasure all the voices that can now be heard that were always there that were not heard in mainstream mass media run by people who look like me, old white men. And uh, I, I think that's the cacophony of democracy. And the idea of mass media and a controlled media is a myth going back to, I think, basically the beginning of at least TV. And, and the idea that Walter Cronkite said, that's the way it is. And people said, no, it's not. So if we can return to conversation and understand conversation, I think that's everything. That's why I started a program with my colleague, Kerry Brown at the school in engagement journalism that begins with listening because that's the key. I think um, you mentioned in the book, Tom Standage's book, The Victorian Internet, but it seems as though you never saw this one of his, which is the first 2000 years of social media. And he makes a similar argument that um, the period in, of corporate media is an anomaly historically. And uh, he has some wonderful little analogies he makes. He calls sl the slaves running back and forth between people, sending messages, you know, taking messages many times a day. He called them Roman broadband. <laughs> Roman broadband with slaves. Um, but in many ways, he's saying something similar to, to what you're and this. This book is about, I think it was 2011, I think, maybe. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, Tom is, Tom is great, a, a brilliant writer from The Economist. Um, and when the corporate media start, I can, I can market it a few times. I wrote another book that's out next month called Magazine, which is a little tiny book. I was going to ask you about that. How oh, are you, yeah. you going to write? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you about <laughs> another one in a minute. Um, uh, and, and magazines were fascinating because they had their arcs, right? They started for purposes. Hopper Moss would argue that Tatler and Spectator led to the, the public sphere and the coffee houses of London. Many, including me, disagree with that. Um, the business model of, of, of the attention economy, of selling your product at, at a loss to make money on advertising started in 1893 with, with a magazine. Um, uh, I think that Time Inc. became the, the corporatization of media and shifted that way. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, exactly that shift of when companies took over. I'm not saying that, I mean, I'm, you know, I started magazines, I work for companies. I'm not saying that that's uh, necessarily wrong. I, I'm, I'm concerned with trying to help my, my students earn a living more than ramen noodles doing the journalism they do. We've got to figure out sustainability. But I think we've also lost sense of the human scale. Before the mechanization and industrialization of print, the average circulation of a daily newspaper in the United States was 4,000. It was a good Substack newsletter. And then of course, then it scaled to the point of hundreds of thousands and millions. And, and I hope that we can return to a human conversational scale now. Well, here's, a, here's another question. Uh, how did the advent and evolution of print impact the concept of authority? I think that's an important part of your book. Uh, it, it is. And it's fascinating to me that in the early days of print, print was not trusted at all because the provenance was unclear. Anybody could make this pamphlet. Anybody can make a Twitter post. Anybody can make a Facebook post. Anybody can make a blog or a podcast, right? And we didn't have the systems of authority. My favorite anecdote comes in 1470, which was reputed to be the first call for censorship of print. When Niccolo Perotti, a translator, was much offended by a shoddy translation of Pliny, and he wrote to the Pope and said, you must do something, right? Sound familiar these days? Something must be done. And he said, you must appoint a censor, a reasonably erudite scholar, to approve all of these things before they're printed. As I thought about that, John, I, I 
realized that he wasn't asking for censorship at all. What he was seeking, what he was predicting was the, what would follow in the institutions of editing and publishing, which would establish mainly for good, not always perfectly, but would establish the authority of print sometime in uh, over half a millennium. And those institutions now I think are inadequate to the scale of speech we have today. And we're gonna have to reinvent or replace institutions to figure that out. One more second here. For the next book I'm writing, coming out next year from Basic about the internet, uh, and then I'm right now writing the one after that. Uh, the one about the internet, I, I asked myself, what happened? What? How did people determine authority before print, before encyclopedias, before publishers and editors and librarians and, and so on? And I came across this concept of FAMA, F-A-M-A. -A. I don't know if you ever heard of, of that. Yes. And so there's a few books about it. And fama uh, means it is said in, in Latin. And it's really about the reputation that attaches to the teller of a story, to the information in the story itself, to the subject of the story, and to those who spread it. And everyone has to make their own social judgments. Does this person know what they're talking about? Who do they talk to? The things a reporter is now deputized to do today, everyone had to do that. And I think everyone has to do today online. Who says this? Where did it come from? Do they have any authority? Do they know what they're talking about? And so that, that social sense of authority is something we've got to figure out anew. You mentioned censorship. Now, there's a move of extreme censorship, including book burnings that are being uh, forced on us by figures of authority. How, how, how do you uh, deal with that? How, how does society deal with that and not end up in a total fascist state? God help us, I wish I had the answer, Scoop. I, I think it's, however, a predictable and, nat and, and, and almost um, natural extension of whenever there are means for more people to be heard. Again, those voices were always there, but they couldn't be heard. When there are the means for more people to be heard, those who controlled these means before are going to resist, are going to try to stop, are going to try to st shut it up. And I think they will inevitably fail, right? The Vatican in its index of forbidden books, which lasted until the 1960s, created a lot of bestsellers along the way. Um, there's a, a, a paper from Rand that came out the same year Google started in 98 uh, by, by uh, 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 Dewar is his last name. Uh, that said that the countries that tried to control print were left behind in progress. Um, and now I think what we see happening is that uh, I, I mark a lot around Black Twitter. I held a, um, a Black Twitter summit at the school in February convened by four scholars of Black Twitter. And it's fascinating to me that communities that, again, were not heard, represented, or served by mainstream mass media could create places for themselves, not just Black Lives Matter, which of course is profound, which may be a, a reformation of our day, but also the everydayness that Black Twitter provides communities to be themselves not under white gaze. Well, I think what happens then is that the old white people who were in charge resent the arrival in the conversation of these, to them, new voices, again, they're not new. And so they try to tamp it down and they use authoritarian means to do that. And they will lose in the long run. I have that belief from history, but in the short run, it's awful. What was that thing, that online audio thing? Was it called Clubhouse? Yeah. Where people, so I was in a discussion there where uh, there were basically white people on the stage talking about the black experience and the blacks who were in the audience, one of them managed to get on stage and threw everybody else off and just took over basically. And I thought, perfect, you know, that's the sort of thing. But what, uh, what happens now, Twitter is kind of collapsing and now we have Mastodon, we have Blue Sky, we have um, Threads. It feels like there's kind of a balkanization of what was kind of centralized as social media there. How does that fit into your sense of what's happening post print, post print era? I don't know whether it's a balkanization or whether it's a proper reorganization. When you interviewed Amy Bruckman, she talked about liking not only Reddit, uh, I think it was her or was it you, Wendy, who talked about um, uh, Mastodon? And I probably did, although Amy is on Mastodon. 
I mean, I would have thought that Mastodon is a great example of what you you're advocating, which is this return to a a many many owner you know widespread digital culture that doesn't involve a corporate owner because because you know the problem with Threads and Blue Sky is they could they could easily recapitulate Twitter's history. Well, Threads Blue Sky to- says they're going to be federated. Well, yeah, really but they aren't tools. now. They aren't and, now, not yet. And no. Threads is very definitely going to stay Mark Zuckerberg's personal property. So, you know, it just sort of seems like we already have Mastodon and it's working and we have these federated servers. And so it seems like a good opportunity to just build the thing that we have. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, I think that Musk taught us the lesson that by putting public discourse in a centralized place where one nihilistic narcissist could take it all over, is is dangerous to that public discourse. Did you, did so, you hear that? Did you hear my favorite line that I saw on Twitter like a year or two back? On the internet, your home always leaves you. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah. I can't laugh at it because it's just so incredibly true. I mean, yeah. if you look through the history of the internet, it, there's it's filled with things. Tw- television without pity was a very successful website. Everybody was having a great time critiquing television shows and along comes tv guide buys it and decides it's not profitable enough and shut it shuts it down yeah and it's happened again and again yahoo and aol killed all kinds of things the, the history of, of of black online space which charlotte McElwain writes about in his book black software was about companies like aol taking things over and then killing them um i i do think that mastodon shows us a model and i love mastodon i hope the blue sky does federate and and, and show some options but here's the interesting thing, too, that I have to remind myself of all the time. I was raised in the era of mass media. So we look at Twitter and we think, well, that's big. And if you talk to Twitter, you're talking to everybody. No, Any, everybody who's talking to anybody on Twitter is talking to a small slice. It is not mass media. It does not operate that way. And so it actually presages what I think we're going to see in social media going forward, which is people in small communities. When I sw- shifted to Mastodon, too late, uh, I will I will confess, uh, it didn't take long to get to a critical mass of enough people I found interesting to have great conversations with and get value from. So I, I think that we have to have people reset their expectations that it's not about talking to everybody as a matter of macho size. It's a matter of the value of communities. Well, well you know, you kind of bring up something that is kind of a common issue with people who are communicating online that sense that if you post something on Facebook, if you post it on Twitter, you have this huge audience that a lot of people are hearing it. And you know, I came to realize that whenever I post something on Facebook, I'm lucky if 10 people see it, you know, uh, there's a kind of derangement there, I think. <laughs> but the, the big thing with Twitter was because journalists really took to Twitter because it was a text-based medium. And as soon as the journalists were there, the politicians go, oh, we got to be there because the journalists will see what we say. And so you had this ecosystem of the people who consider themselves and their views important in the world because they can act, you know, the politicians, because they can actually change the lives of millions of people and journalists because they can report on things that matter to millions of people. Um, You know, that symbiosis was what really, I think, made Twitter the place people felt they had to be. And, you know, particularly in other countries where, you know, if you were trying to get a story about oppression in some global country in the global south and you were trying to get the attention of the Western world, Twitter was a great way to do it. Um, so, yeah, you know, a lot there, of that was there, because is a, the there is a real loss in losing that. I agree. I agree. It is. It absolutely is. Uh, I'm still there um, when it comes time to pay him. I'm not going to do that. But um, I am still there because I think that 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 deserting it, especially as journalists, means we once again leave behind these voices we did not represent. Well, I feel it's my job to watch it die, basically. Yeah, I agree. Well, we don't know kind of what we're watching at this point because it's so uh, mercurial. I mean, uh, Musk changes his mind every week about what he's doing with Twitter. I, I find myself wondering if he's going to sell it to somebody at some point who would and then it? we'll be in a whole new era of Twitter. I don't know. I can't imagine. I certainly who's, couldn't who's recoup his buy losses. A site, who's going to buy a site that whose current owner has basically wrecked what was good about it? You know, uh, it's good. Point. Yeah, I think it could go bankrupt. And then the banks who have 13 billion in it, not 44 billion could take it over at a decent price in essence. 
uh, and then find responsible management. But you're right, it's been, it's been just beaten down and ruined. Uh, it's hard to know what his real strategy is. You know, one thing that, this is going off topic, but one thing that I've been fascinated by lately for the internet book is when I started looking into AI, because we all have to to this day, it's practically a statute that everything you talk about has to end up with AI. So I'm, I'm meeting that requirement right now. Um, I got fascinated by uh, the faux philosophies that drive Musk and Thiel and Altman, the long-termism and this, this macho size uh, of, of thought of scale, number one, but number two, this idea that what matters is the future, not the present. And, and it's kind of, it's, it's scarier than the technology, in my view. My early career was in radio news, and I became a real student of the history of radio. And it's a good example of early um, corporatization ruining a mass media. It started out as all these little local radio stations all over the country, all over the world. And they were truly local. I mean, they only could broadcast maybe 50 or 100 miles at the most. And as radio grew in popularity, you got the big networks coming in, NBC, CBS, ABC. And then somewhere we ended up with the giant conglomerates taking over and buying all the radio stations, Clear Channel being the main uh, offender in there. And as a result, there is no longer uh, a lot of local radio. It's all just plugged into the mass media uh, mothership and uh, you get what you get from them. And if you want local news, you have to probably go out and ask somebody locally. Well, that's why we have podcasts now because yeah. Yeah, we, had the door. We, we had the, we had the technology to be able to create an alternative. I was going to ask you, Scoop, have you read the work of Robert McC McChesney? Uh, no, on, the, no. on the history of on the history of corporate media, he's really good. Another book that I was I'm fascinated by that I quote at some length in, in the Gutenberg parenthesis is by Gwyneth Jackaway. It's a history of radio's entry into the media ecosystem and what newspapers did to try to stop it. They would not allow it to carry news. They insisted that they had to buy the news from the wire service. They would allow news to go up only twice a day. No advertising associated with news. Uh, they wouldn't allow radio people to talk about a news story until 12 hours after it happened in this doctrine of hot news that the newspapers owned it. Uh, it finally didn't work when enough newspaper publishers bought radio stations, so it opened it up. But you're right, then came the networks, then came scale. A scale, again, started in print, but led uh, in radio, and then again, worse in television. The other interesting thing is the, the response of legacy media to new media has been predictable. What newspapers try to do with radio, they try to do with TV, and they're trying to do with the internet now. Um, radio, it fascinates me, is healthier in Europe, partly because there's uh, public funded radio there. Uh, they don't have satellite radio. Um, podcasts were a little slower taking off there. Uh, so it's a little healthier, but I think radio in the US is already dead, don't you? Well, I don't think there is any equivalent to Clear Channel in, for example, Britain. You know, you still have right. the, the big the big man on campus is still the BBC. Um, I've lost what I was going to say, so somebody else can take well, it. Well, the, uh, the whole thing of uh, the corporate radio, the main impact it's had on local uh, communications is there really is no... Uh, uh, early warning system. I, one of my early adventures in radio was when there was a tornado warning, I got on the radio and told people. And I've heard many of my uh, friends who also are former, from, from, uh, formerly doing radio, now they're doing podcasting, but they experienced the same thing that they got to where you couldn't interrupt the corporate broadcast no matter what. And it, it just strikes me as amazing that you would have these people deciding no you uh, your your station uh, can only broadcast our stuff you can't go in and say there's a tornado coming and that's just frightening uh there was a story oh i just lost it um i just saw a story before we got on together uh of starting a podcast uh radio network 
Beasley launches podcast radio US in four markets. This is an effort to take the best of podcasts and make a radio station out of it. I mean, fine, if they promote you guys um, or the Twit podcast, that'd be a wonderful thing, but there's only so much time on the air and there's only so much promotion, uh, but it just also shows how they're desperate for content now. Isn't that basically just Spotify? I mean, Spotify has been trying to buy up all the most popular podcasts. Yes. The difference here is they're going to do it on, on, on terrestrial radio. Oh, I see. They're going to rebroadcast podcasts on terrestrial radio, which is kind of I think they're a going to wonderful get sued full pretty, circle. I think they're going to get sued pretty quickly. No, I think they're going to do deals to do it. Yeah, well, well they're, they're, yeah, but but one of the things about podcasts is there are these net, there are these networks that are sort of, have been sort of consolidating, you know, for a while now. I I think that I think that's going to, I I don't I don't think that's going to kill independent podcast. In in fact, because, um. I don't know. I, I think Spotify might be regretting a hundred million or whatever. I think you're absolutely right. Everything. Spotify is. They thought they could take it over. Like, you know, I went through this with blogs in the New York times. Um, I had a, a fascinating discussion with Bill Keller, then the editor of the New York times, where I was trying to make peace with bloggers and said, Bill, you should invite the bloggers over for a bagel. And we went through this amazing epistolary exchange that I put up on my blog, of course, and he knew I would. Um, and the New York times Pashad blogs, forget it. They're, they're ridiculous. I remember then, this. And then, of course, they started doing it. A guy named Saul Hansel became a blogger on the Times, and the blog voice came into the Times. But then the Times got tired of it and dropped it. And that's the cycle we see again and again. Mm -hmm. Something new comes in, it's ignored, it's nothing, then they decide to take it over, and then they kind of ruin it and leave. Uh, I asked yeah. Dave Weiner, uh, as kind of the zealot of, mm -hmm. of so many internet, internet uh, innovations. So they're at the beginning of helping with RSS and podcasts and blogging. And I ran into Dave at the um, International Journalism Festival in Perugia a few years ago. And I said, Dave, what happened in the early days of blogging? You know, we had blog roles. We blogged to each other. It was kind of great. And Dave said, in his inimitable style, he said, Jeff, everything is good when it starts. And the question is, can we keep it that way? Yeah, I think my experience was that Twitter was the thing that really killed a bunch of blogs because you know, particularly people who like to write were keeping blogs. And this, then they sort of, oh, I can reach a bigger audience with 140 characters and not have to do all the all the work of, of writing 850 words and looking up links and get, getting references and all the rest of it. And everybody just migrated to Twitter. And I said, yeah, it ruined me. I, I, I'll confess. Yes. Now, I said, I'm just going to keep writing Net Wars. And so, I've, so Net Wars has appeared every Friday since 2001. <laughs> well, are, are we trying to predict where we're going? Because I after reading the book, I realized that I just don't know. I mean, you really convinced me, Jeff, that it's really hard to predict where all of this goes and that we're so early into the Internet era that we're still, you know, we're still sort of saddled with a lot of baggage from the print era. I think that's absolutely true. I think that we look at the future and the analog of the past. And if you look at newspapers and magazines online, they're recognizable as newspapers and magazines. I tell my students every year, you're the ones who have to rethink, redesign, reimagine, reinvent journalism. And it's hard. Uh, students today were born after the internet. They don't remember an early internet, let alone the ability to imagine a later internet. I taught a course with Douglas Rushkoff a year and a half ago called Reinventing the Internet which was a lot of fun. I mean, I wrote the book. I bet it Google was do? fun. And he wrote the book, Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus. So we were, we were a nice contrast. And um, the students kind of couldn't imagine a different internet than the one where they have today, a corporatized, centralized internet. But we, you, we all are old enough, sorry, to know that there was an internet before in the early days and there's something to hold on to. So the question, John, is I think we have to convince people, this is why I do that timeline from 1450 to today, to say that we do have time. And we have responsibility and we've got to decide the internet that we are building brick by brick. And it's not just about the corporations, it's also about us and how we behave. And, and the, you know, when, when we're nasty to somebody, that's the internet we're building. When we spread something that's too good to be true, that's the internet we're building. Yeah, and some of the more interesting stuff I see going on is happening on platforms like Discord, where it's kind of stealth because you've got a bunch of Discords. Uh, you'll have a Discord server, some guy sets it up, he gets some number of people on it and they'll be like smart people sometimes they'll be influential people and they'll start having discussions that could be pretty productive but it's not happening 
It's like it's not a public thing. It feels more private. It feels more intimate, you know, and I think there's a big piece of the Internet like that. Yeah, and I think it goes back to the essence of I'm going to plug my magazine book again. Uh, I'm here to plug mainly the Gutenberg book, but I'll plug that, too, because it's out next month from Bloomsbury. Um, uh, that the early the earliest magazines, Tatler and Spectator, were highly conversational again in the coffee houses. They put up a lion's head with an open mouth and a box inside so that the people in the coffee house could drop in things that would appear in the next issue of the magazine and the conversation. It was a, it was a feedback loop, right? The, the, the magazine fed the conversation, the conversation fed the magazine. And you go to the earliest magazines in the U.S., you go to Ben Franklin and, and Webster too. They begged people to contribute to the magazine. They wanted the voices of people. When Harper started in 1850, it, uh, its mission was was very much curatorial. There's so much stuff out there now. There's an abundance out there now. We're going to find the good stuff for you before they started making their own stuff. And so I think that's where we are today. And once again, the, the first reflex of a new means that enables more speech is to say, we got to play whack-a-mole with the bad stuff. And instead, in time, we shift our attention to saying, let's find the good stuff. And I think we've got to create the means and institutions now to discover and nurture and support and recommend good speech. And by that, I can mean that that can mean anything. It can mean authority or artistry or information or utility. And it's not going to be one size fits all anymore. I saw some of this. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, I saw some of this uh, uh, in uh, the International Symposium on Online Journalism, which is held every year here in Austin, and which I used to go to pretty regularly. And uh, one thing I saw there was that while you had, you know, the sort of established forces in journalism were tearing their hair out because they couldn't figure out how to make a buck. They were worried about how to make money, but you had people showing up who they were very like absolute basic journalists with a journalistic uh, thrust, you know, and they didn't worry so much about how you were going to make money. They worried about how to leverage the new technologies and leverage them most effectively as though they just assumed that there would be some way to support that effort. And in many cases, that's been the case. I mean, I think that, that we've had some, uh, some interesting and innovative stuff happening with journalism. And sometimes it happens within, you know, like the Gray Lady, the New York Times or some big established publication. But a lot of it is also happening at smaller scale, uh, smaller publications. There's nonprofit uh, news organizations starting to appear like the Texas Tribune here, here in Texas. And, uh, and there's also like Substack where anybody can kind of set themselves up to be a journalist and, and journalists who previously depended on newspapers to pay them find themselves making a lot more money because they have a Substack. Well, I, I think you'll find if you look that vi that's true for very few journalists. Um, one of the problems we have is that with things like Substack or, you know, other things like a medium before it, some of these other things, what happens is at the beginning, when the field is mostly empty, the things that are really good stand out and they, those people make money. But if, you know, if you tried to set up a Substack now, how would anybody find it? You know, it, it it's a very cluttered field. One thing, one di one business dynamic that we hardly ever discussed is subscriber acquisition cost. I learned this the hard way in a magazine at Entertainment Weekly. When I went back to look at the at the numbers on this, we were spending forty five dollars a head to acquire a subscriber, and about that same amount of money to print and distribute the magazine. Right, clearly because of the business model started in eighteen ninety three, we made money instead on advertising, and so all of our readers were valuable to us. Um, one of the business dynamics that fascinates me is what I tell my students is the uh, the myth of mass media, which is that all readers see all ads, so we charge all advertisers for all readers. And it was a great myth while it lasted. You buy the newspaper and every advertiser thinks that every reader is going to see every ad. Well, online, that myth is busted. It's not Craigslist. It's not um, uh, uh, Google. It's just the way the internet operates. You only see the ads you see. The buyer and seller are put right together. There's a new and tremendous efficiency 
that's created that we don't have from old media. Yeah, and even with, when you have something like impressions, impressions don't necessarily mean that the ad somehow seeped into the brain of the person who was viewing it. It's, I think that the internet, among other things, was an enlightenment for advertisers. And I can remember, well, you remember the dot-com bust, and preceding that, there was this sort of like awakening among advertisers that... that um, the ad space they thought they were buying wasn't real, basically. Oh yeah, um, and and one of the fascinating things about Google at the beginning was that was that it it, sh it shared the risk with the advertiser. That if nobody clicks, you're not going to pay. If somebody clicks, you can pay. So we're going to try to to get it the same way. I, 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 if I had money, which I don't, and I've quit my job, so I really don't now, um, I would invest. And then Press Forward has started $500 billion to save local journalism. God bless, I'll salute that flag too. One of the things we need to reinvent is advertising. Uh, because without, there's not enough philanthropy to go around. There's not enough subscription money to go around to support the journalism we need. We're gonna still hope to be involved somehow in advertising. But advertising as it exists is bankrupt. It needs to be rethought. And the primary thing about that is, this is core to the Gutenberg parenthesis. This is really why I decided to write the book is, we have to kill the idea of the mass. That the mass is an idea that says that, that we don't need to listen to people. We don't need to understand them as members of communities or individuals. We really don't want to hear them. We can agglomerate them into this, this abstract pile, this, this crowd. And that's what we have to get past, not only in media and in the internet, but also in marketing. And I know that might sound weirdly heretical for me as a journalist to say, but I had a center for entrepreneurial journalism. We've got to figure out new mechanisms of sustainability. I hope it's possible, but one of the things that I notice <clears throat> is that in the history of the internet, it has tended to go the other way. I remember when AOL first started in the UK, for example, they had all these, they commissioned all these niche forums and you had people, you know, sort of doing really, really small community things. And then as soon as they started selling advertising, well, the advertisers really wanted mass eyeballs. They wanted, you know, they don't, they don't want niche communities. They want, you know, your Procter and Gamble, you want to sell soap to everybody. And like over, practically overnight, all those niche things were, were wiped away. And the same thing happened on CompuServe and the same thing has happened elsewhere. You know, it's just, it seems to be that I think that's what's gone on with Amazon's video content. They started out making all these really wonderful little niche shows like Tig Notaro's One Mississippi or, and, you know, one day the guy, came, guy, guy comes in and says, I don't want to do this anymore. I want my blockbuster. I want my, I want my Game of Thrones. And, and, you know, all that niche con content was, you know, killed overnight. Scoop, you're going to say something? Yes. Uh Throughout most of my life, I've always had a newspaper uh, subscription, the the real paper thing. I I, I was a, I'm a throwback, I guess. I like a lot of analog things. I'll, Does this mean you have a bird? <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> I should anyway. But you know, I finally uh, just I got tired of paying a thousand dollars a year for our local newspaper, which was starting to smell a little gamey. So I just did the digital. Uh, subscription and I was a pre in the print uh, issues of uh, the local paper they were just overwhelmed by ad there were ads everywhere you you had to really search to find a, a news article <laughs> and a lot of the so-called news articles were actually paid for they were just a little tiny thing said paid advertisement but it's it's formatted as a news article and I, so I got the uh, the digital, and today I was reading the digital version of their paper, and all of a sudden it was getting pop-ups of ads. They didn't, you know, they already had the ads in the digital virgin, virgin, version, <laughs> but they are doing now pop-up ads while you're reading your article that you really were interested in. You suddenly get an ad for new tires or whatever. And uh, I, I don't know how long this newspaper is going to last. Is, is this something that's ha happening everywhere? Or do oh, we yes. have a really <laughs> bad newspaper? The last good reason to print, the last good economic reason to print and distribute a newspaper is the inserts. 
FSIs, we call them freestanding inserts, coupons and stuff. Those are basically gone now. Best Buy used to make a billion dollars a year with its insert because it was a media property. They would sell space to Samsung, right? But then this critical mass of, of circulation of the newspaper fell below a point where it was worth it and they're gone and coupons are online now and all that's gone. This is why some papers reduced to a Monday, Thursday or a, a, a Sunday, Thursday um, cycle now for a subscription because that's when it had the inserts. But the inserts are gone. Classifieds are gone. Retail is gone. Uh, so print is pretty much now unsustainable. Advance, the company I used to work for, which includes Connie Nast and, and Newhouse Newspapers, in the early part of this year, their most innovative local site, I started all their local news sites, um, was in Alabama. And they just turned off the presses on four newspapers in Alabama and Mississippi, just turned it off. I have long told publishers, including that one, that they had to imagine a date in the not too distant future when print would be unsustainable. And if they weren't sustainable digitally by then, then they were dead. Advance really has done that. They went digital first. They milked the print as long as they could milk it. But then when it goes, it goes. I think that's going to happen with magazines. As I say, Entertainment Weekly is out of print now. Murdoch, I mean, Meredith has, has uh, at, at um, uh, Dot Dash, as the company is now called, has killed a lot of the print magazines that are there. Rumors have it that even People Magazine might go out of print, which is amazing. Uh, everybody thinks they're going to get subscription revenue. But again, there's always so much to go around. Two thirds of all digital news subscriptions in the US go to only three brands. And you know them, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. Everybody else splits the rest. Um, I think we've got to look at new models. Texas Tribune, John, is a, is a good example of this because they've, they've branched out into events and sponsorships of various sorts and consumer revenue in addition to philanthropy. Uh, and, and I think news organizations are going to have to do that. They're also going to have to become more efficient. But fundamentally, I think they've got to reinvent their mission. It's not about um, repeating everybody else and, and filling a bunch of content in a day. It's about whether the community has benefited, whether individuals in their lives benefit from what we do. It's long seemed to me that The Guardian was doing a lot. It seems to me like The Guardian is doing a lot of the things that you're talking about. Um, you know, they're very clear that their mission is to unite the democratic peoples of the world, basically. And they're owned by a trust, not not a company, you know, and, and that was one question I had for you, which is like, my impression is that one of the reasons newspapers were hit so badly so quickly by the internet was that they had corporately consolidated and they'd been loaded with a bunch of extra debt. So they didn't have, they didn't have the money to invest in the way they should have. So The Guardian, uh, God love it. Uh, I worked with them for quite a bit of time. I used to be a media podcaster there and, and media columnist, and I helped them on their membership program. And the membership program isn't membership, as they know. It's begging. At the end of an article, the editor, Kath Feiner, says, don't you feel guilty? You just read this great journalism and you didn't support us, and it works. So for the first time in a long time, The Guardian itself is profitable. Yes, they're owned by a trust, but it wasn't a bottomless pit of money, and that could have gone to nothing. And so they had to find sustainability. They had to have be responsible right. stewards to the journalism. Your question about the corporate entities is exactly right. And they consolidated, they got a lot of debt, and then the hedge funds came in and they specialized in buying bad debt, buying distressed debt. That's what happened to all the chains. So that except for Hearst and Newhouse, virtually every chain in the US is now controlled by a hedge fund. Um, and they're not gonna invest, they're not gonna innovate, they're going to milk Bessie until she falls over in the field. Um, and it's about ca it's about free cash flow. That's all it is. And so, you know, the question that I come as I, as I leave the journalism school where I am now, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, teaching and doing things otherwise, but, but it comes to my valedictory moment. And I, I've, I've, I'd be curious to hear what you all say. I've thought over the years that part of my job was to help the big old companies, which is rather egotistical to think I could, but that's what I do or to turn my attention and say, give up on them. And it's gonna come from the, the, the new little things that are out there. And I'm not sure, to your point, John, to predict the future, I'm not sure where the future of journalism comes from. It has to come from my students, obviously, because I'm too old and they're young enough to do this. But if I direct them, where do I direct them? Is there, is, is, can you still fix a Gannett or is it too late and we've got to build alternatives? Well, let's say that you've got a really nice big bar that everybody likes to go to, and eventually the owner is 
ready to retire for That's whatever an reason. Metaphor, if I've ever heard one, but keep going. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he uns unloads the bar. The bar goes away, and this the whole area that it serves has no bar. So what happens? New bars come. I mean, yeah. people start building new bars, and they may compete a little bit. There may be multiple bars instead of that one bar. And eventually there's a replacement for it. I mean, I think what happens if new say local news isn't being reported anymore by in our case, we have the Austin American Statesman, which is now a Gannett publication. And um, um, it's basically USA Today, but they still have local stuff and they actually are doing some very good local reporting right now. But if that goes away, uh, it's not going to be covered by like the television news uh, locally, uh, they do a little bit of local reporting too, but nothing of any real substance. So what happens? Somebody's going to have to come up with something, you know, somebody's going to have to fill that void that, or maybe people just don't have local news anymore. I don't think that's what's going to happen because I think that the reason we have local news in the first place is because the need was there and somebody had to fill it. So I, I guess I'm being optimistic, but I thought for a long time that that uh, it surprises me it hasn't happened in more places that that you know someone with a little entrepreneurial spirit and a small amount of money could you know could restart local journalism simply by going around the neighborhood and saying you know if you'll pay me two dollars a month or, or some small subscription fee I will cover school board meetings and build from there you know just sort of you know go to do the local council, do the local school, you know, the, the things that people really want to know about, but don't have the time to follow closely on their own. I would have thought, I would have thought somebody could have made a good business out of that by now. So I started a program uh, in my school in entrepreneurial journalism, which is now aimed at those individual uh, people who want to serve a community. And yes, it's possible, um, but it's hard. And a lot of journalists don't want to run a business or sell ads or uh, they don't like math. Uh, and so, you know, that's an issue, but I do think uh, that that's the building block of a future. There's other interesting things going on out there in journalism. Uh, City Bureau in Chicago trains uh, residents to report on their neighborhoods and then pays them to do so. Uh, Outlier Media in Detroit answers people's questions. Texas Tribune, uh, the city in New York, um, uh, spaceship media, which is really interesting about uh, bringing communities and in conflict into conversation. There's a lot of wonderful experiments happening out there. They're small, but they're efforts. In the UK, uh, there's the Bristol Cable, and in Scotland, the Ferret, mm -hmm. which it, both both are cooperatively owned, and both are doing some really good investigative work. In the early days of blogging, we used to think that blogs would sort of fill many gaps uh and the, the idea that we had was that yeah we we might still have a local newspaper or we still might have newspapers reporting stories maybe national or local you know but that bloggers would bloggers would be seeing the events being reported from multiple different perspectives and would report from those perspectives and that people would be able to read across blogs and get a much more multi-dimensional sense of what was going on. Now, that's not what's happened, but it does leave me wondering whether maybe something like the blog could have a bit of a resurgence and, and fill the gaps for, for fading news organizations. I think it is happening in some places. I mean, I, I go back years ago when I was running Advances Local Sites, I held a meeting of local folks and said to a woman named Debbie Gallant, uh, why don't you start a, uh, a local blog in Montclair, New Jersey? And she said, it's a hell of a good idea, Jeff, but why would I do it for you? And she started a site called Baristanet. And Baristanet just recently, a few months ago, merged with another local uh, news site in Montclair. And just uh, two nights ago, they had an event where people came out to support it. It happens. Uh, West Seattle blog, uh, Red Bank Green in New Jersey, Morristown Green in New Jersey. It's scattered. Uh, it's very scattered. And, and it's hard to imagine what's going to make it uh, standardized. But it's possible, and it's proven that it can happen. And I think if enough people care about their town, uh, they might be able to do it. I smell the need for a foundation there to kind of feed into those efforts. Yeah, I mean, supposedly uh, uh, the Knight Foundation and uh, MacArthur and a whole bunch of others just came together in what's called Press Forward, which they're going to put $100 million a year over five years into local news. But actually, that's not a lot of money. 
Um, uh, there are efforts out there. My friend Aaron Pilhofer at Temple University started something called Tiny News, which is an effort to be able to get some of these small things off the ground. Uh, News Pack at WordPress is trying to help them technologically. Uh, there is an effort um, uh, to bring together, I'm forgetting the name of it suddenly, uh, a revenue hub for local news. There's a lot of help efforts out there, but at the end of the day, it's got to be a journalist who says, I'm gonna, I don't have a job anymore. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a go of it, but it's risky and it's hard. Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily have to make make them wealthy, though. Not I mean, all. yeah, I, I, journalists. I've talked. I've talked to plenty of journalists who were happy to just be able to live comfortably doing what they do to to ply their trade. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. And again, I think this goes back to the early history of media. Again, back to scale. Uh, when you when you know. Cervantes, I think Don Quixote's first press run was something big like 1500. Um, and that was a bestseller. That was huge. It was gigantic. Uh, uh, when, uh, you know, one thing that fascinates me about this is that up until that point of mechanization and industrialization of print, which I talk about, you know, I'm holding in my hand, for those of you on video, a piece of type. This is the letter R. And you think about all the words in every language all around the world for the first half a millennium were set one letter at a time. And that was a governing factor on how big things could be. That's why the, the linotype, which is my next book I'm working on, had to come along, uh, alongside steam powered presses and the telegraph and cheap paper and other things that led to that scale. But for the vast majority of the history of media, once again, it was small. You could only make as many pr papers as you could pull off the press in a day and they could only go as far as your wagon train or eventually um, a train could go uh, the maximum circulation of a paper was around four thousand the maximum circulation of a monthly magazine was around twenty thousand um, that's the scale where we were you mentioned the linotype that's a tool of media and uh, i'm a big fan of tools of media the typewriter i remember the evolution of the typewriter from the clunky little manual up to the ibm selectric which which revolutionized me being able to write stuff for radio because you know, the radio stuff you didn't just come off the top of your head you had to have a script sometimes and there's all sorts of tools in in, in radio the tape recorder came in and revolutionized uh, recorded audio and that was replaced by digital recording, which is what I have in front of me right now is a digital studio. And I'd love to see a history of all those tools. Well, my next book that I'm working on is History of the Linotype. That's great. I, you know, the, the stuff you had about the Linotype in this book just, oh, it's I got really excited. I used to hang out around Linotypes. I, when I was younger, I worked at a typesetter uh, and, and of course, they were doing uh, digital photo typesetting, but in their basement, they had a bunch of linotype machines yeah. and they were still, they still had customers for those. So yep. they were still setting type down there. It but, was but you're right, Scoop, that had a huge impact. That's, that was the last machine needed to make mass media happen. Mm -hmm. It was a tool. And I'm just now writing the, the bit of the chapter about this when uh, uh, Devin, who was a famous, famous typographer and printer in the early days uh, of, of, of the mechanization period uh, said there's gonna be a machine that's gonna help us set all this type. And he worried about the relationship of machine to pardon the sexism here, man, the printer, right? And um, it's, it's not the same at all, but it's somewhat analogous to the conversation we're having today about AI and generative AI. What's our relationship with the machine? The, the, the line type is gonna turn out whole words, whole lines faster than anyone could imagine. And the printers who did it one letter at a time were gonna be eliminated. They smartly in the beginning days said, we're gonna take this over. And the International Typographical Union survived for three quarters of a century until they tried to fight cold type, which was the next thing that came in. Uh, now we look at generative AI and we say, oh my God, it's gonna replace writers. No, but it does, it's the final nail to my mind in the commodification of this idea of content. That since Gutenberg, we thought that content was that which fills things. And that's not the essence of creativity. It's not the essence of art. It's not the essence of journalism. Uh, it's about conversation. It's about the, the acts that we're talking about. 
And so can we get ourselves out of this mindset of copyright and property? And that to me is the big mind shift that we have to do probably over generations. Well, the thing is, it's not ordinary people who have the mindset of copyright. Uh, mm -hmm. Most ordinary people, as Jessica Lippman said years ago, would be horrified. If they would they would disagree violently if they under, really understood all the provisions of copyright. No, the people the people the copyright helps are the people that it was actually originally designed to curb, which is publishers and and rights holders. And uh, you know, I mean, I was, you know, Taylor Swift had the right idea. When, the, when when a hedge fund bought her she old, often does these albums, days. she said, you know what? I can still play music. I still know musicians. I can re-record these from scratch and my fans will understand that they'd rather buy from me. And that's what she, you know, but the book author, you know, it's, it's harder in a way because you can't perform your book very well. And Amazon, Amazon's Amazon has taken taken over the ebook market and, and it's, it's lists are filled with, with junk. Oh my gosh, we have the makings of a whole nother long podcast episode. <laughs> well, that's that true of every podcast we future. do, isn't it? <laughs> yes, indeed. But well, we have run out of time, and I really want to thank you, Jeff. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so much. Very fun. Been an yeah. honor to be here. You can stay in touch with Plutopia at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, look for at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. This is the Plutopia News Network. 20 minutes into the future.